folklore. Uh, the folklore is a platform that's providing consumer goods brands with the technology, education, and community needed to grow their businesses and collaborate with global partners. So our software and marketplace tools, we help brands manage their wholesale business online um, and as of recently, uh, be able to access capital. Um, in our education and community initiatives, we it really enables brands to connect with each other and share resources and provides opportunities like this webinar uh, that we're hosting right now, um, and it, as well as content to learn about like industry standard business techniques. So this webinar uh, will be exploring how to leverage influencer marketing for your brand's growth and creating impactful strategies. Um, because in today's digital landscape, you know, really making sure you find the right voices to represent your brand uh, can have a significant impact on your market presence, customer engagement, and what's most important, sales. Uh, so whether you're new to influencer marketing or looking to refine your strategy, we've brought together an experienced panel to share their brilliant insights um, into identifying influencers who align with your brand values, setting clear objectives, and then measuring the success of your campaigns. So we're going to break it down. Uh, first, we're going to introduce the panelists. Uh, then we're going to ask the panelists questions. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end um, for you to get your questions answered live. So you can, throughout the webinar, whenever a question pops in your head, put it in the Q&A um, section of the Zoom. And we will try to answer as many of those as possible. So. It is time for me to turn it over to our lovely guest here. Um, so could each of you start by uh, introducing yourself, your name, um, and just a little bit about yourself? Who's going to go first? You go, Renny. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Renny Avino. I am the founder and creative director of Rendall. Rendell is a women's wear clothing label and our ethos is to create pieces that make women feel confident and seen. I'll go next. Hi everyone, I'm Sahida Abdul. I'm an influencer marketer based here in New York City. I specialize in relationships and strategy, um, primarily with tech brands. However, of course, my passion started off with fashion and beauty brands. Um, it's been a wonderful ride to see how the industry has scaled from just small gifting opportunities all the way to seeing influencers be a part of the Super Bowl. And I have also have played a part in those strategies as well. So really excited to share my insights with you all. Hi, I'm Chrissy Rutherford. I am a former fashion editor. I worked at Harper's Bazaar for almost nine years. Um, I left my job actually four years ago this month to um, pursue my own path. I'm a full-time content creator. I've worked with brands like J. Crew, JW Marriott, Caudalie, Saks, net a -Porte, Jimmy Choo. Um, I also have a newsletter called Forward Joy. I do DEI consulting with my business partner, Daniel Prescott, uh, where we work with fashion and beauty brands to help them implement anti-racist strategies in their marketing. Um, I'm also a podcast host. I was hosting a mental health podcast for Maybelline. And yeah, I think that sums it up. Amazing. We have a very talented group of people joining us today to give you all the gems. So really happy to have you all here and we can jump in and we're going to just start with, you know, creating your, your strategy and content, um, your influencer strategy and content. So my first question, and this is directed to all of you, is when is the right time for brands to start working with influencers? I would say when they have a really clear brand identity uh, mapped out to understand what kind of influencers would actually fit within that message that they're trying to put out there, along with understanding what their budgets are. Because although giftings are sort of like low lift, there's still some kind of budget that needs to go into it. Shipping costs, the cost of the goods um, at, at cost, if you will. And then um, really mapping out like quarter over quarter, what would that look like so that it doesn't just go flat? I think those are some of the, that's the right time to start working with influencers. If you have a really strong brand identity, 
and you know what your budgets look like to actually support it. So on the um, brand owner side, I would say when you have really like perfected your product, because some people you make a product and then you send it to an influencer, it's not, maybe it's not the best product. And then they happen to bring you loads of sales. And then this is your one opportunity to actually reach a large audience and you mess that up because people buy from you and then the product isn't great. So I would say your product really needs to be unlocked. And you also need to have the capacity to handle large orders because you never really know how many sales you're going to get from this influencer. So you don't want to mess that opportunity up where you've gotten all this traffic and then you're not able to fulfill it because a lot of the times you really only get one chance. It's, some people get multiple chances, but you don't get that many opportunities to make a first impression. So if someone comes to you and they order and they've seen it on their favorite influencer and then they come to you, they order it, it's taking months to get to them or they've gotten it and it's not the best quality, you've kind of already messed up the whole relationship on that end. So I would say yes, when you have like a really good product and you've, um, you make sure that you have the capacity to fulfill the orders and you can also deliver it to them properly. They've definitely given the best answers, uh, but I would also <laughs> say that, you know, it's important to establish relationships and think about it in terms of community building as well. I think a lot of times, especially now, relationships with brands can feel so transactional and especially you know, coming from the editorial world, it's like, I really like to have a relationship with a brand, even if it's like from the beginning and, you know, like anything else, the best relationships are authentic. So I love when a, it feels like a brand sees me as their ideal customer and they want to build a rapport with me. Okay. All fabulous answers. And I'm just a follow up to that. If anyone wants to chime in around, like, do you think there's like a specific point, like you should be in business for two years, or is it really just a matter of these benchmarks that you're, that you're referring to right now? Like you could be doing it at the launch of your brand, as long as you, you know, have been able to consider the things that you all just mentioned. For sure. Yeah. I it, oh, you go first. <laughs> I, it really is just about quality versus timing, I think. Yeah. I think you really put in, make that investment into your brand to have a really strong brand identity, have really strong product, and um, even just like the fulfillment process, if it sells out, do you have like more stock coming in? Um, if you have all of those logistics down pat, influencer marketing will be a seamless integration into that because you've already like did all the work on the back end to support that infrastructure. So it doesn't matter if you're like two years in the business. I've seen brands launch and on launch day, they already have relationships with influencers, um, more on like the founder, more on like the, the PR company that they're working with or the consultant that they're working with to support that. But um, to Christy's point, relationships do matter. And if you are putting that balance of like strong product and identity with those relationships, it'll just be like a rocket ship and launch. I Love think she's, she's basically covered it. So you're right. on to the next one. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next question, uh, Sahida, this is for you. Uh, what steps do you recommend taking to create an impactful influencer marketing strategy? So I know you mentioned some of the the important things to consider. So what it, when you're creating that strategy, so you've you know you've been able to say, you know, I, I have the budget. Um, I have the product behind me. I have the fulfillment. Now, how does the strategy work? How do I start? For sure. Um, understand what message you're trying to put out there. I think that being really dialed in on that messaging will be really key in figuring out which influencers to really partner with. So, you know, there's different cultural moments that you could support. It could be ongoing or it could be something like Valentine's Day that you're trying to dial into. But Valentine's Day, it could speak to like, plethora of people it could be like older couples, younger couples, Gen Z couples, LGBTQ couples, figure out like what message you really want to align on and then go all in on that. So once you have that down, then you'll be able to figure out what the tiered approach may look like. Are you trying to invest in just celebrities? Are you trying to invest in micro influencers? You're trying to do something that's a bit more of um, a, a tiered approach that like speaks to all levels and know how you're going to roll that out. I think 
once you have those three steps in place, you can figure out like the who that really go falls in line um, to really make an impact. So don't just like lean into one audience, try and figure out like how you can build upon an audience segment and then diversify from there. So in my strategy sessions, I think that once we figure out the messaging portion of things, it becomes a lot easier to say like, oh, I know this exact influencer that talks about this on a regular basis. They could plug and play right into this opportunity really seamlessly. And it feels like a mutually beneficial partnership because whatever the product is that we're launching, it feels like their audience could also um, gain value from it. So let's say for Rennie's branding, for instance, she's pretty size inclusive as well. You need to know, like, how can you pull on these different lovers and make it feel really authentic for all parties? So that's not like, oh, you're just coming to use this, the size inclusive community. Like, Renny like, shows up consistently in that space so that it doesn't feel like it's going to get called out. So, you know, messaging has to align with the brand at the end of the day. And I think those are some of the important steps I take when it comes to carving out those strategies. Okay, definitely. Messaging number one, you heard it here first. So <laughs> next question is for you, Chrissy. Uh, should an influencer campaign always result in direct sales? Uh, what are some other metrics and KPIs to track when creating your strategy? You know, I would say not always. Not always results in direct sales. I think especially for me, I know that when a brand is coming to me, there's, you know, there again, like as Sahita kind of said, like you have to identify what you're really hoping to get out of an influencer campaign. Is it that you want sales? Do you want brand alignment? Do you want brand awareness? Um, but I think for me, typically brands are coming to me for brand awareness and brand alignment. Or are you seeking out like a particular community? I work with also like a lot of wellness brands. And because I also speak about mental health a lot, you know, they're seeking out people who kind of sit in these niche categories um, just for pure alignment. But I wouldn't say that I'm someone that a brand would come to immediately um, if their goal is direct sales. I think that's a very like unique influencer who can post a link to something and like the product is going to sell out. Mm -hmm. Like, sure. There is, there is a group of influencers who really do operate like that. I would say my community is typically not because could be from the price point of things that I share. Um, but also I consider myself to be a very conscious consumer. And I think I've cultivated an audience that also operates like that. So they're not necessarily going to be like impulse purchasers. And sometimes people want to like sit and think about something for a while. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I definitely agree around the, you know, how many people can really just post something and it sells out. Like I think people are, yeah. are, are used to seeing <laughs> the Keith Lee TikTok <laughs> effect and thinking that that's just what it is for influencers. Truly. And it's amazing to watch when people do have that kind of power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a lot of influencers who have like very intense parasocial relationships with their audience are typically the influencers who can drive that. Gotcha. So then we're in, instead of just sales, we're looking at brand awareness. So that could be an increase in followers that can be you know, just now you have a new person who never heard about you before that, you know, is it may have not made that purchase right now, but, you know, now they've signed up for your email list. So things like that are also ways to measure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because I used to work as an editor, I think I'm seen as an authority in the space. So a brand coming to me, you know, believes that my audience really trusts that I'm not going to share anything that, you know, isn't authentic to me. So hopefully it's like, yeah, if people see me posting something, they're going to be like, oh, this is actually something worth checking out mm -hmm. if they're aligning with me and with, you know, some key people that fit the brand narrative. Yeah, that's a testament to you having some really great social capital over there. So <laughs> Love that. Okay. And then uh, Chrissy, this question is also for you. Yes. What are the di different influencer campaign types? 
Um, and how should brands select the most effective format for their specific objective? You know, as always, thinking of what you clearly want out of your influencer campaign. I mean, there's obviously, there's giveaways. I think that's such a great way to get eyeballs on your account, hopefully grow your follower count, um, depending on how you work with influencers to do giveaways. But, um, you know, if, if a Typically, the rules are, you know, you follow me, you follow the brand, et cetera. Um, discount codes, I think, are also everyone. Everyone loves a discount code. Everyone loves a deal. Um, and I really love that when I work with brands, when they offer that to my audience, because also if you are looking to drive sales, that's hopefully going to get people over that hump to point of purchase if they know for a limited time they can get this for 20 percent off. Um, you know, we have affiliate and commission as well. I think that can be great for brands that don't have big budgets. Um, or sometimes if you need to supplement, um, someone's rate because you can't meet their full rate. So if you can offer a competitive affiliate commission, I think there's also incentive to the influencer in that, you know, hopefully it's something that you're going to use ongoing. If you share the content that was agreed upon, but you know, if you continue to share this link, people continue to buy the product that you're also going to continue to make money off of this. So it's a bit of a gift that keeps on giving. And, you know, I think UGC is hugely popular, especially with Brands that have very, very small teams. And, and what is UG UGC? Oh, sorry. User-generated content. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of these brands only, especially if you're a startup, you only have a few people and you can't, and also you might not have the budget to be, you know, churning out content at the rate that a lot of other brands can. And again, maybe you also don't have huge budgets to, um, pay influencers to also post on their account. You can work with you can work with you know influencers who are only going to create content for your brand page, but they're not necessarily going to share that content on theirs. Um, and yeah, and I've done that with brands before too. I think it's it's a really easy way to, I think, also have visibility on that brand's page, but if they can't afford to have the content live on both sides, that's, you know, the best way to go. And then of course, of, uh, you know, the typical content exchange of a brand's going to come to me and ask me to either produce a reel or do, you know, a static post or just stories or a TikTok, all the different ways that, you know, people are making content. Okay. okay. A lot of different ways to go about it. Okay. Uh, so Sahita, this question's for you. How should a brand decide on a budget for an influencer campaign? For sure. So just starting off with what the cost of gifting people would be, would be really important. So factoring everything that goes into that. So ship costs, getting the product and knowing what your numbers are going to be should really set the bar for what you can afford essentially. So I know that some people would say like, I want to gift a hundred influencers, but realistically, can your brand actually support that? And then also support overhead at the end of the day. Um, so just try to be really strategic with that as the first step in determining the budget. And then it, the possibilities are endless because um, from there, you just would need to know, like, how do you launch something and then sustain it? So if you're going to use your hundred K budget, by God's grace, everyone has a 100K marketing budget. <laughs> um, and then are you going to just go all in on this one launch in March? Or are you going to spread it out 25K each quarter, hopefully spend less in one quarter and see more results? And then you could roll it over into the next quarter um, to really start like utilizing it before the year is over and like see the growth in the brand from there. But um, I think that just start with what you can afford is going to be the most important advice in crafting out that budget. Gotcha. And so there's a, there's a budget for how much it will cost to gift the products. And then there's a budget for how much you would cost to pay the influencer. For sure. There, and I'm so happy you brought that up. There's two separate budgets within that. Um, I'm looking at 
the budget that you pay influencers with on my day-to-day -day basis. And when you set that budget, be very realistic, do your research. It's very important to understand the different tiers of influencer and the cost that comes with it. If you see someone who's using a photographer or videographer, just know that that influencer has their rate and then they also have a photographer or videographer rate that they have to attach to like continue to create that quality, high quality content. So if you are going to create a budget, be very aware of that along with some of the things that go into, um, a really robust influencer strategy, which is having usage rights. You can't just solely rely on an influencer to post the content on their page to reach their audience. The best strategy is a coupled strategy where you have a paid social approach to it and you purchase those usage rights. So um, that can sometimes be about like 30% of whatever the influencer's rate is. Um, so if you are looking to build that out, put in the cost of your goods, the cost of shipping, cost of an influencer, the cost of a videographer, photographer potentially, and then add in 30% just for usage rights, just to ensure that you have that um, all covered. And then on top of that, your budget for paid social ads. So like, what are you going to be paying for like meta at the end of the day to make sure that you're boosting those ads out in the right sphere? So lots of different things. And what is usage rate? Um, yeah. usage rate is just, it's usage rates is the right for you, a brand to repurpose the influencer's content for their own social channels. Um, it can sometimes be through the influencer's page known as whitelisting, or it could just be like through the brand's page, which is just a regular paid social. And that's those, those are the ads that you usually see coming up on TikTok or Instagram that you're like, I'm not following this person. I'm not following this brand, but somehow I'm seeing it. And that's the best way for brands to reach new audiences. And sometimes with certain faces and names that are really recognizable, um, the usage right covers what we like to call name and likeness um, in order to make sure that that person is being compensated for you know, this known face in the, in the internet and in, in the internet interweb, um, that popped up on your feed that you're more inclined to like click into that ad for. And there's usually a time period for the usage rights, correct? Like a year, two years. It's not really in like perpetuity. Right. Perpetuity is, um, just unlimited usage, meaning that like the brand will own the right to that content forever and ever. Um, that's very unlikely. And a lot of big bucks for that. Yeah. Podcast <laughs> <laughs> informed wow. a lot of people about that. Um, and usually it all depends on how much money you get. So when I say that 30% of whatever the influencer's rate is, that is per month that you'd be paying that. So 30% of the rate per month. Um, so thinking about whatever your launch is on you want to figure out like, do I really need this for 12 months? Do I really need this for three months? What is it really going to support to then map out that budget as well in the usage yeah. rate? I'm learning so much. I've been coming a little fake influencer recently and I need to up my prices. <laughs> I don't think I've been charging. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the drawing board with, real quick. Um, I, mean, okay. I think usage is what typically trips people up the most. I think especially from even the influencer side, they don't realize that they need to be tacking on extra charges on top of like what their flat rate is, whatever for the content that they're making. The usage is, you know, typically where you can, you know, make more money. For sure. And I forgot to mention, I used to manage influencers as well. So that's why I learned like, oh, wow, we could upcharge on everything. If there's exclusivity, that's double the rate. Like there's so many different things that you have to be aware of in carving out your budget and carving out your campaign. If you exclusively want this influencer using your product, wearing your product, then you can't just say like, I'm just going to give you this flat fee and you can't talk to any of your other competitor on any of our competitors, because that is going to be hurtful to their business as well. Although they like love your business, want to really like push it out and support it. If they have that exclusive relationship, now they're missing out on a relationship with another brand. Um, and that pigeonholes them that like lowers their like 
access to funds as well. They're also a business to create that content for. So um, just be really mindful of that when you approach an influencer and say like, I want to work with you exclusively and have perpetuity on your content. It's like a, no, 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 no. <laughs> no these, are, these, are great. these are great things to consider. And Rennie, how do you maintain a balance between giving influencers creative freedom and maintaining your brand's guidelines? I think for starters, you have to approach people whose, um, whose content you actually like, because if you're approaching someone whose content you don't like, then there's already going to be issues. So you have to meet someone who you like the way they create their content, you like the messages that they pass along. And then I think communication is very important and being honest. So this is what we're trying to promote. This is what we're trying to get out of the collaboration. And then they can tell you, okay, I don't think that I'm going to be able to help you achieve those goals. It's like what Chrissy was saying about um different people have different goals it's like some people want new followers some want new sales so if you're going to an influencer and you're saying oh the goal of this campaign is to get 5,000 new followers they might be like that's not really what I do so you really need to have like proper conversation with them to say this is what we're trying to achieve can you help us achieve this and then I think it's important to allow them make what type of content they usually make because their audience knows their type of content. I think you can tell when an influencer is really just trying to make what the brand wants, because then I can't really identify with what you're doing anymore. So I would say, yes, it's important to let them make what they usually make, but communicate what the goals of your campaign are, what you want them to um, let the customers know. So you basically have your part, they have your part, and then you find a place in the middle where both of you can meet. Okay, good stuff. And now we're going to get into finding your ideal influencers. And I know we touched a little bit on it um, already about the different types of influencers out there, but Sahida, I would love for you to share more about what those different types of influencers are. For sure. I am. It starts off with like tiers of influencers, um, thinking about just solely the metrics, nano influencers, people who have like less than 10k followers is what I mean by that and then you have micro influencers this scale fluctuates it goes from 10k to 100k I've seen even like even to 200k it's all about how you define it for yourself as a brand and then we have micro macro influencers who are um I like to usually say like over that 200k plus mark and then we even have mid-tier influencers that are at 300 to 500 K. And then you have more of the mega influencers, um, that will be like reaching over that million mark. So, um, the mega influencers are some of those bigger household names that you see. And then, um, you then cross a really fine line between mega influencer and celebrity, but celebrity will be the final tier and the types of influencers that are out there. Um, some people even like to bucket it all together as talent. So, um, First, you start off with that, and then you go into the different categories as well. Um, the categories would range from, you know, beauty, lifestyle, fashion, wellness, understanding, like, what's their overall messaging in there? And then that's how you can really, like, understand, like, which influencers you're going to decide to work with as well. Gotcha. Okay. So the I'm in the, uh, what was the first one? Nano influencer. I'm in that one. That's uh, that's my <laughs> that's my bag right now. I was gonna say I, I feel like in the past I also heard like micro influencer goes up to like 500k, which seems crazy. Oh wow! wow. Yeah, All that is very one. high. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm shooting at the little numbers. So um, one day. <laughs> Um, well, there's okay. a lot of power. There's a lot of power in the in the nano influencers. Listen, because when people first started reaching out to me asking me to do stuff, I was like, for what? I don't have that many followers. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, it's about this and it's about that. I was like, whatever. If you're gonna give me money, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you're tasting. Listen. Um, okay, <laughs> so let's go to Chrissy, how should brands determine whether to aim for nano, micro, macro celebrity influencers? How should they determine which ones to go for? I mean, I feel like this is a better question for Sahita, but, you know, <laughs> again, like you got to start with like, how much money do you have to spend? Because 
the macro, the celebrities, like those are expensive people to get. And, um, you know, I know it sounds probably like counterintuitive, but I think, and Sahita, correct me if I'm wrong, but we typically tend to see higher engagement at times with smaller accounts. And I think that's why um, micro and even nano influencers have become so important. I mean, I think especially the nano, because uh, I think, I don't know, for me, I typically see like nano as sort of like Gen Z or younger um, influencers at time because they just have these like really tight knit communities and because they have such smaller followings there tend to be like more connected to their audience and probably spending more time talking to them in the comments and in the dms and so their engagement is going to be um much higher and i think with you know the macro influencers who are definitely breaching into the celebrity territory when they get so big. And I think uh, sometimes like the, I don't know, I think it kind of erodes the trust that their audience has in them because they seem like celebrities. Gotcha. And budget, I guess too. It's like, yeah. what can you afford? <laughs> right. Just to add to that, um, going back to like the marketing cycle of things, like when you look at the funnel, brand awareness as at the very top it's just like do people even know your brand are people aware of like what you have what you have going on and then you go into consideration and then you get into like the conversion factors of things so just know where your brand sits in that whole funnel so if you are really looking to get your name out there and you're going for like overall brand awareness Due to your budget, you may start off with a celebrity or you may start off with a macro influencer. But if you really have a smaller budget, maybe you have to start off with 10 nano creators to start really generating buzz and making noise so that you're able to then start scaling into those other tiers. So when you look at it, really take an honest look at your brand and say like, are people aware of like what I have going on? And then if they are, hopefully you can move into that consideration part of the funnel and then build upon the relationships that you had in the awareness stage and start rewarding them to like help you move down into conversion. Nice. Okay. And just a reminder to everyone, put your questions in the Q and a chat um, so that we don't miss any in the gener general chat. Um, so we can make sure to get those questions answered for you. Uh, okay. So what's in, what's the importance of engagement versus uh, Sahita, this is for you. What is the importance of engagement versus follower count? Which should brands pay more attention to? For sure. When it comes to like follower count and engagement, always go for engagement because just think about a stadium that has a hundred thousand seats, you know, if those seats are all empty, that just, that's low engagement. Like no one's there. No one's clapping for the, clapping for the, the teams and the stands. But if you, you know what the impact is of like 80,000 people being in a room together, you know, so that would be like the most important thing. If you're going to work with an influencer, always look at engagement at times, at times I would say. Um, but to add into that, I think context is very important because like Amira, you're a tastemaker, you're an authority within a space. So um, you may not have like the highest engagement. I don't know, personally, I haven't checked your page in engagement, <laughs> but- I had have, my likes, I, so you wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> may not have a highest engagement. that to like, Amira. <laughs> but out of the people who are following you, that's the people that, you may really want to reach, you know, like you may want to get in front of me, Christy and Remy at the end of the day, um, a, a brand may want to get in front of us and it may just be through you. I think I saw, um, there was a brand called Triangle Swim. They mm -hmm. took the strategy of gifting all of Kendall Jenner's friends, which made her feel left out in <laughs> and made her want to have Triangle Swim as well. So I think- I like well, look at the quality of the audience as well. And if this yeah. person has a strong authority within a space or has like connections to who you're really trying to get to as well as um engagement first, and then the quality of the um actual audience would be the best way versus follower count. Follower count means nothing. I think we saw something where a girl had like 3 million followers and she didn't sell like not a single t-shirt. 
Mm. I don't know if you guys saw that one. It was just, I think it was an influencer in like Europe. And I was just like, millions of followers. Yeah, yeah. In like, and a lot of people are still out here buying. Followers. So that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> how do you actually, how can you actually measure people's engagement? Because you can see followers, but how can you actually measure the engagement? Comments. Is that what you're saying? Comments, okay. yeah. And then the type of comments and what they're saying about like what you're posting and okay. okay. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> comments. Comments are a really huge factor. That's what you could see publicly. Um save yeah. shares if you get that data. Um link clicks as well. Link clicks really tells me how much like potential people went to look at it. Yeah. 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 So um when I worked with the brand, we used to have a calculator to put in that to understand like what our overall ROI is going to be if we worked with this creator based off of their followers, the link clicks and the overall engagement that they had. The data scientists, because I'm not that smart, created that for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. It was really strong. I love it. Okay. And Rennie, what do you, well, how do you determine if an influencer aligns with your brand's identity? What are three things to look for? Or just if you want to work with an influencer in general, what are the three things that you're looking for? I think firstly, it's actually important to know what your brand identity is. So what are your values, your mission, who, your target audience? And then when you know strongly who you are, then you research influencers who kind of align with this. So do they have a similar target audience to who you're trying to reach? And then I really look at their content. Like, so what kind of content do they make? What kind of brands do they work with? Um, what is their content known for? How do people, um, when they comment, what do they say? Do they say, oh, I really like this. I'm going to buy it. Or are they commenting on something else that's not even the product of what they're advertising? So these are things that you really, really need to look at. But I always say that you need to, you need to put people in your industry. Because I find that, so maybe a makeup brand, and you want to work with an influencer who is known for maybe speaking about mental health or something like makeup isn't really their core. So their followers aren't following them because they want to know what makeup they're using. They're following them for something else. So I think it's very important to approach influencers who are actually creating content in your field. If not, then the thing might just go right over their um, um, audience's heads. Okay. Makes sense. And then I have a follow-up question for you. Have you ever worked with an influencer that ended up being wrong for your brand? And what did you learn from this? Well, I don't think that I've actually worked with anyone who has like negatively impacted my brand. I think in that way, I maybe I've reached out to people who align with me, but I do think that I have people that I might not work with again, just cause they haven't really fulfilled the end of the bargain. So a lot of the times you actually have influencers reach out to you and ask for a gifting and say, oh, um, if you give me one, two, items I'm going on holiday and then maybe they post the picture and there's like seven other people with them their outfit the outfit is barely showing so it's not really done what it's supposed to do so in that vein I would say maybe I have people that I wouldn't work with it again because they haven't pulled the end of the bargain but I don't think I really had anyone that has negatively impacted my brand and that's a good point that you brought up of influencers reaching out to you asking to work with you I I wonder, you know, because you don't want to leave a bad taste in anybody's mouth. How do you go about saying no? <laughs> um, because you don't feel like you're aligned with you. Um, like what's a, what's a way to still be able to maintain that relationship? Because they're clearly a fan of what, you know, what you do. Um, so how can you maintain that relationship still? So people have reached out to us. And so we have um, budgets for each quarter and we're going to work with for that quarter. So sometimes you can reach out to us and we actually don't have the budget anymore, but we do have like a directory that we keep. So if we're not able to work with you now, we respond and say, well, thank you for your interest, ETC. Um, we're not able to gift you at this time. However, we will keep your details and reach out if any opportunities arise. And then if you do have a bigger budget at some time or at the time that maybe we're giving out discount codes or something, then you can, I can reach out to this person if their content actually aligns with the kind of content that we want. And if it doesn't? And if it, well, it hasn't happened yet in terms of their content, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. So we haven't, I haven't reached out to everybody yet, but we okay. do have a directory of them. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> And then if it doesn't, I guess you can actually just explain to them that honestly, A, B, and C is what we're looking for. And at the moment, 
um, you're not really creating that kind of content, but if you do create this type of content or you're able to give us this type of value, then we'll be willing to work with you. Okay, so leaving the door open, just giving them what the metrics are that you're looking for. Well, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and Chrissy, when you worked with emerging brands, what stood out to you that made you want to work with it? So a brand that might not have had like a right. Maybelline budget. <laughs> you know, I I come from the editorial world, so I'm pretty discerning still about the brands that I work with because I've seen it all. There's a lot of product out there. Um, I think first and foremost, like I want to feel a connection to the brand, feel like there is a need or like a real use for their product in my routine. I really love to know the backstory. I want to know who's the founder, why did they launch this brand, what problem or like gap were they trying to fill when they created what they created. Um, you know, really considering is this something I'm actually going to use. Um, I look at inclusivity. What does their Instagram website look like? Who does it seem like their ideal customer is? Um, you know, brands are usually taken aback by how thorough I am and also sometimes annoyed by the questions that I ask or that <laughs> I want to have a solid like two weeks with like a beauty product before I agree or, you know, go to post about it. Cause you would be surprised by how many brands, I think, especially like the more established ones will kind of just, they want you to sign on. And then they're like, okay, can you deliver the content by the end of the week? And I'm like, wait, I, I need some time to like really, you know, get used to it and try it out. Um, so yeah, but I, you know, I love feeling like I understand where a brand is coming from and I see how like it fits into my life. Okay. And then one last question for you, and then we're going to hop into some of the uh, Q&A questions because I know there's a lot in there. When is gifting a uh, products appropriate versus offering a paid collaboration? Right. So, and this is obviously tricky because it really depends on, are you an emerging brand? Are you an established brand, et cetera? Um, so I'm like, gifting is appropriate if you are not expecting anything in return right away. Um, or like you formed a relationship with <laughs> an influencer who feels invested in getting the word out um, with your brand. It's like, listen, we've seen a lot of those TikToks, like don't harass influencers, you know, if you've just simply gifted something. And I think there's a way to go about it. If you're an emerging brand to say, Hey, I've been following you. I would love to establish a relationship. I want to send you my product to try out. I would love your feedback. I would love if, you know, you know, for you to share it, if it really resonates with you. Um, and I think like seeking out influencers who seem like they're actually really into discovery. Like I, there are a lot of influencers who I think really are known for like discovering new products and sharing new brands and are really excited by that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a great approach to take. Be but like for me, I think when someone has gifted me something and it feels like they're pressuring me or constantly following up with me, I will often say like, I will send this back to you. Mm. And I've done that with a lot. It's and not I've even worth it. Like, and I've done that with big <laughs> brands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, cause I accepted this under the impression that it was a gift. Yes. So if it's mm -hmm. not, and it comes with conditions, I'm happy to return it. Or you can pay my fee. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I love that. All right, so let's jump into some of these questions in here. Um, so, Rini, I think this would be a good one for you. Um, we have someone who asks, how do you go about approaching um, influencers that you want to work with? Is it a DM, a formal email pitch, ex et cetera? How do you ensure you'll stand out? So what has your experience been there? So if I have a personal relationship with them or we follow each other on Instagram, comment on each other's pictures, etc., sometimes I would send an email and a DM. 
But if someone I've never met before ETC, I would send an email. And I know it sounds obvious, but so many people send emails out to multiple influencers and I forget to change the name. So I've had people reach out to me as a brand and you're calling me another another brand name. And it's already a first red flag for me because I'm like, yeah, you don't even care about me that much to get my name right. So I would say make sure that the email is very personalized to who you're sending it to. And um, yeah, reach out to them, say, introduce your brand so this is what we do this is how long we've been around this is our mission etc we see that you're interested in these type of things we think that our product will align with what you're interested in then you have to also be like realistic about what you want from it so what, like what chrissy was saying if it's a gift you're telling them up front i'm gifting it to you and you're not expecting anything back but then if it's like a paid collaboration then you say this is what the consideration is can you share your rates card so that we see if this aligns but I think a lot of people, because most people don't have budgets, they go into it in a shady way in that you gift them and then you just expect that they're going to post you on their page. You no, know, it usually doesn't happen that way. So I think, yeah, just be very clear about what you're trying to achieve from this and get their names right, send it to them, make it personalized. So like, if you know that this person really likes lip gloss, for example, then you're sending them, liquid. you're not telling them, oh, I'm going to send you a hairspray. Because a lot of the times you're more likely to get um, benefits out of it if they're actually going to use the product so yeah i would always say send an email though and then maybe follow up with a dm but i think the more professional you go about it the better okay makes sense also, also i want to say on the gifting note because this, this just popped into my head if you are a brand and you want to gift something i think it also makes it a lot easier if you let the person choose the product that they want a lot of times 100 brands yeah. just want to like send whatever they've deemed is like their gifted <laughs> product their gifted item and someone might accept it thinking okay well let me just get this free item from them but then they're like eh, that actually doesn't work for me yeah. like, I think it's just so much more beneficial when a brand lets me choose even if it's like okay well we only have these three things but give them something to work with no for sure and Sahida this next one is for you um can we talk contracts? Is that something the brand owner and influencer should come to the table with? Or does the influencer sign the brand owner's contract? Well, I have to preface this by saying I'm not a legal professional, but I have <laughs> seen many contracts. And when it comes to that, you want to have a clear outline and understanding of what those things like usage rights, exclusivity, payment terms um, would be just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and you honor that so no one gets sued at the end of the day. Um, usually the brand will come with that information so that you mutually agree on it um, and the brand has it on file for themselves and the influencer, of course, will also have it on file, but try to make it a standard and con consult with a legal professional to help you map out what your standard contracts would look like, what the standard usage terms are, and things that you can obviously um, change up whenever appropriate. So if you have your standard of 12 months of usage rights, maybe you need to flex down to one month for that particular creator or take out the exclusivity so that you're able to um, effectively like have a, a really strong relationships, like good business sets having good contracts. Very true. Uh, thank you. Um, and what I saw something about what kind of prices do nano and micro influencers typically charge? I guess range wise, anybody can answer that. Prices are made up. I'm just going to say that right now. Um, there yeah. is <laughs> to prices, but prices are all made up. I've seen nano influencers charge what I, is usually within range for a micro influencer and in, in the inverse. So um, it all depends on what value that creator places on their content and their audience. I would typically say that nano creators will charge less because they don't have the numbers. Um, but if they are working with professionals, photographer, videographer, have set design, things of that nature that are um, going to be factors you need to like be aware of when you reach out to them. So if you have sticker shock, just Take, take a step back and say like, oh wait, they actually, <laughs> this is not just iPhone content, no shade to iPhone content, but like you just have to know like there's a lot more at play there. Um, typically for nano creators, I would see like 
depending on what the deliverables are too, it could be anywhere from $1,000 to $2,500, just to put that in your mind. Um, but it's not the standard. Everyone makes up their own prices. And then for micro creators, I could see anywhere from like 2K minimum all the way up until like 15K, depending on like what it is that you really want. So if you wanted six videos, just know videos cost a lot more than photos. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got in here. Um, Rennie, we'd love to hear how yeah. you used influencers to grow your brand. So funny enough, I think I would actually actually attribute like most of our growth and awareness to influencers. So what I try to do is work with influencers in different countries, different cities, so that you're getting as much exposure as you can from different places. Because at the end of the day, the world is so connected now that you can ship anywhere in the world as long as they can play on your website. So I would say I try to work with multiple influencers, but then work with them multiple times. So I would work with, if I work with you in January, I might come back again with my next collection and work with you again. But I think, honestly, it's just reaching out to as diverse a group as possible so you can reach as many people as possible. Okay, so you would say, like, influencers are a big part of your growth? 1,000%. Okay. 1, Actually, 1, wait, I also have a question for Renny to jump, yeah. to piggyback yeah. off of that. Because do you work with different tiers of people, like, in the same round? Or are you typically only looking for, like, a certain like follow so it now. would usually be different it would usually be different tiers because each tier mm -hmm. is for like a different to get a different goal so if i'm working with somebody who has like five hundred thousand followers for me that's more for awareness because it's reaching more people if i'm working with somebody who has 20k it's more because their um followers are very invested in what they're doing etc so yeah. it would really depend but in it in each collection or campaign we usually work with like different tiers of people because we're trying to achieve different things right cool yeah. Uh, someone asks, are there any influencer search tools that any of you would recommend? For small businesses? Social no. media. No, you just <laughs> be dialed in on social or work with a, a consultant or an agency to give you a really curated list. Um, yeah. When it comes to like some more of the larger enterprise brands, I've seen like Creator IQ, Aspire IQ, grin um captivate there's a number of tools out there but if you're a small business i i'm just not sure if they would be within budget for you because some of them it's like sixty thousand dollars a year to mm -hmm. just access the tool <laughs> who's actually <laughs> going to be running the search now you have to hire someone or have an intern do it but you can have an intern just like really dial in on social and curate a list for you and that could be really cost effective so I would recommend that when you're first starting out. Gotcha. Okay, we got time for- Let me also add in, <laughs> wait, one second. So if you're a small brand, I would say social media. So something that I do a lot is people who have worn my brand, I look at who they follow and I look at, go through their list and see the influencers. So that way you're able to find the people that are influential to them and that's free. So you can do that on TikTok. You can do it on Instagram, general social media. So that is usually free in terms of looking for- who the influencers are and then i guess on tiktok also just searching fashion influencer in america for example or in, in you bring it down in new york in la or whatever and then that also brings up because they usually put hashtags in their um, in their posts so you're usually able to find these people okay yeah, and when I, think... I worked at bazaar i used to do that when i was just like kind of searching for new people to like keep tabs on for style stories or whatever i would like find someone that I liked and like who are they engaging with who are they following mm -hmm. and just kind of follow down the rabbit hole exactly exactly <laughs> and I'm trying to see if I can find one last question um and I guess this this last one can be uh it was something around oh so Renny this would be for you is there someone that I believe, um, do you have an influencer management team? If so, how do you, uh, how did you know it was time to put that team together or who is the person who's actually doing it on your team? So I actually just got one recently mm -hmm. and I didn't realize how informally I was doing things until I got someone to handle it. 
because so I ended up gifting some influencers and they had hit their like counts. So she's asking me, she's like, why would you give someone who has their like count and we can't even tell what the engagement is? So I think we're that, worth it. Obviously, when you're first starting off, <laughs> no, no, it's not that, <laughs> yeah, but like the brand also needs the brand also needs to be. So I didn't even think about it, but I guess it comes from a perspective where the brand needs to be able to tell if it worked. Yeah. So if we can't see any results, then we don't know if the partnership worked. But I think obviously when you're first starting off, if you don't really have a budget, something that you might do by yourself. But as you begin to have a budget, I think you need to prioritize that if you decide that in for the partnerships is what is going your your ad budget is going to be, you actually need to start prioritizing people who can do it better than you. Because I find that as business owners, we try to wear so many hats, but there's only so much that you can do. And you find that when you get someone who's actually an expert in this field, they bring a lot more to the table. So I think once you have the budget, then you should definitely consider getting someone. Well, I learned so much from this conversation. <laughs> uh, I love all the engagement that happened in the QA, Q&A and questions. So there's so many questions that everybody still has, and I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all of them. But uh, we did record this, so we'll be putting this um, on our YouTube and, and social channels. And then um, I'm sure you can send uh, DMs or whatever you guys want to do to the, our panelists. I'm not going to presume, but if you guys want to share where you, where you can <laughs> where you can be followed yeah, you can send a dm <laughs> um my handle is r-e-n-i a-b-i-n-a reni abino on instagram and on tiktok it is the rendell t-h-e-r-e-n-d-o-l-l you guys can connect with me on linkedin if you're not on linkedin then you can connect with me on instagram it's it's sahita i t s <laughs> wait <laughs> it's <laughs> i-t-s-s-a-h-e-e-d-a-t -E -E um and that's it yeah but on linkedin i'll be posting a lot more like resources and stuff for brands and just tips and tricks of the business great and chrissy where can we find you i'm at chrissy ford on all platforms okay amazing so thank you again to all the panelists for sharing your amazing knowledge uh we've heard thank hope you, the whole, you know we hope everyone is learned as much as possible. Uh, if you're a brand owner and want to know more about joining the folklore, you can check out our website and register directly. Um, or you can email brands at thefolklore.com. And um, again, we will have our this webinar posted on our YouTube and on our website in the coming days. And you can follow us at The Folklore um, and subscribe to our newsletter. We do these, we do two webinars a quarter. So our next one will be in April. So thanks again for everyone for attending and we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Thanks for having good one. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye y'all. <laughs> Bye.